call a special meeting of the Oregon City Commission to order for January, Tuesday, January 26, 2016. It's 4 p.m. Uh, Ms. Riggs, if you call the roll, please. Commissioner Shaw? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Polly? Here. Commissioner Mangelberg? Here. Mayor Holiday? Here. So, under general business 16 030, <laughs> we have interviewed the city manager candidates. At 4 p.m., we have Mr. Craig Ward, Mr. Leffler. Just, uh, just a couple of comments. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Um, we're, we're here at the uh, the end of the process, the, the recruiting and selection process. Uh, provided before you a, a booklet with packet uh, packet with materials. It has the candidate application, the uh, job announcement, which I know you're well familiar with both probably by this point, and the interview questions. I. I how to pare down the interview questions uh, from the number that we originally were working with just for time constraints given that each interview is scheduled for an hour um, it, that comes out to roughly tw three minutes per question and I know some of those questions you'll probably want more information on than others um, so time management is, is will be an issue um, to, in order to continue on through the process in an hour uh, I also uh, hope that you read the list of questions that are um, not recommended for interviews. Um, those those questions will could get us in trouble. And if you need if you need any uh, recommend I mean any uh, refresher on what those questions are, let me know. But in anything in protected class wise, or um, you know, any any of those questions, uh, we can certainly go over those. If you have any questions about those. If not, okay. if not, um, I have the candidate questions here on a clipboard, and they have a water, and we are we're ready to start. So I wish the candidates luck. Thank okay. you. Great. <clears throat> I guess that's my cue, huh? Yeah. All right, everybody. Nice to see you again. Yeah, see you, Craig. Commissioner Smith, do you want to go first? All right. Um, welcome. Nice to see you again. Um, why are you the best candidate for Oregon City Manager City Manager position? Well, I guess I'd say I'm the best candidate if you're looking for somebody who has the strengths um, that I bring to the job. I think that those are essentially, I have a very strong economic development background. Most of the major challenges I think that you have as a community, um, I, I've directly been involved in. I'm, I am the enterprise zone manager for the city of Troutdale, so I obviously have experience there. I am the urban renewal director for the city of Troutdale, so I have experience there. Um, you know, I, uh, I have experience not just with the community development aspects of a community and the finance aspects of all of the issues that you're likely to face. Um, but um, I have experience uh, directing a police department. I have experience directing a fire department, although that's a little less direct here. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've overseen a public works department, a finance department, an HR department, uh, a parks department, a rec department. Um, you know, so I mean, I'm, I'm just an experienced city manager who's been doing the job for uh, directly and uh, for more than a decade. And um, and I, I take what I think is probably most critical for Oregon City, and that is I take a strategic approach, and, and I spend a lot of time and energy being concerned about what best course of action will help us accomplish your goals. And you as the arbiter of the, of the public's will, um, you know, I, I take very seriously the council goals and I um, and I cycle back around with the department heads and the staff on a regular basis to make sure that we're focused on the things that you've most said you want to accomplish um, I, I think that I'm you know good working with uh, with other agencies that's important to you as well I've got a lot of experience developing partnerships and managing relationships with uh, with other agencies at everything from the federal to the, the local level um, and I think all of those uh, make me uh, uh, the best candidate for the your position I'll leave that up to you to decide Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Shaw Craig uh, 
please explain <coughs> what you believe the role of our city manager should be. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I hate to repeat myself, uh, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but uh, as, as I noted last night, um, I did serve as an elected official, and, and I think that gives me some um, insight into what it is like to be an elected official and to respond to the needs of the public. Um, but I, I left that role behind me years ago. I don't, uh, don't want to go back. To, I don't want your jobs. You guys have got a tough job. I've got a tough job. Um, and part of my job is making sure that we are, um, that, that the resources of the city, and by that I mean the finances, I mean the staff, I mean the time, um, I mean the priorities of the city are aligned to accomplish the, um, the the goals that the five of you collectively um, define, um, and uh, you know there's a there's a range of different functions that um, get involved in a city manager's job. Everything from facilitating group meetings, trying to make sure that the that information is fairly portrayed to the public in a way that will engender their effective response, so that we know what the public wants. Um, I'm a, a good mediator <coughs> for issues of conflict. That sometimes becomes pretty handy with uh, labor unions. It sometimes is handy with department heads. Um, it's sometimes handy with the public. Um, after 15 years of service um, as a land use planner, I spent a lot of time at the counter dealing with, with problems that we had. That's true for economic development as well. When you get developers who come in and they want something and uh, you know, they want it now or they want it yesterday and you have to work with them and understand what their needs are. Those are, those are critical functions. I, um, so that's what I spend most of my time doing, however, is again aligning the, the resources and the assets of the city to make sure that we're using our assets um, effectively. And and, and I spend, boy, I don't know, you know, I suppose if I broke, somebody asked me not too long ago, what, explain your average day. And the reality is that there is almost no average day for a city manager. Um, and that's hard for people to understand and accept. That's part of the beauty of the job, is that it's so diverse. You never know when the phone rings, you never know when the mail comes in, you never know when somebody drops in at the counter and just wants to have a little chat. Um, and you have to be prepared to handle any of that. Um, the, the example that I use, and I'll bring this answer to a, a halt soon, um, is uh, are, are you familiar with incident management and emergency management? Yes. Well, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a principle of incident management, and that is the incident commander is responsible for everything until they delegate it to somebody else. Well, that's really the function of, that is the city manager's job. Right. I have uh, I have a public works department. I have a police department. I have uh, I have parks department. I have HR. I have finance. I have all of these functions to which I've delegated. Um, but things pop up, and uh, and so I'm expected to be able to be conversant in sort of all of that uh, those issues, and to be able to represent the city to solve the problems, and. That doesn't mean I solve them myself. And so a big part of my job is also teamwork and trying to make sure that the, your staff, your department heads, your, you know, are, are working collectively for, the, for a common purpose. And I, I work with you to make sure that that common purpose is defined as best as we can make it uh, in pretty much any given situation. And, and then uh, working, working with the staff to make sure that they're uh, their priorities and their needs align with your priorities and needs. So that's how I see the job. So I just want to, uh, uh, you, in your uh, resume here, there was a sentence in there I really appreciate it, and I want to kind of, you guys probably saw this too, so uh, you want to enhance Oregon City's reputation as both a model for responsive and creative city government and as a community widely recognized as a preferred place to live and work. Mm -hmm. I thought that's pretty cool. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Not to mention it lined up with your campaign slogan. Christopher <laughs> 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 Pauly. 
Never mind. Some minds just think alike. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project is a tremendous development opportunity for Oregon City with many stakeholders. Provide at least one example how you have previously created agreement and shared purpose with all stakeholders, uh, patrons, government, community later, leaders, to develop a successful community project. What was your greatest challenge? How did you overcome them? Conversely, what was your greatest success? Well, I, I would say my, uh, uh, can I start with my greatest success or do I have to sure. go from the front to the back? Start from the top. I'll yeah. Start from the back <laughs> to the front. Yeah. Um, I, I, when, when I brag about my accomplishments, when I drive and see them, um, I frequently refer to light rail development in SeaTac. Um, and the reason for that, I, do you guys know the lay of the land? You know light rail and SeaTac at all. So uh, uh, the, the critical portion of that is that the light rail is elevated. So um, the original proposal for Sound Transit was for it to be at grade. It was supposed to come down the, hill, in the middle, in the median of Highway 99. The city had done a lot of work um, before I got there and after, but primarily before. Uh, SeaTac had a lot of challenges, and, um, and one of those was the Green River Killer. Now, how does that relate? Well, it relates because uh, the Highway 99 was essentially just a pass-through road. Cars were zipping by on both sides, and hookers were walking the street. And they were getting picked up, and they were being murdered. They were being dumped in the parks. I mean, think about what it would be like to live in that situation. And, and the community wanted, that's one of the reasons that they incorporated, because they wanted control. It was unincorporated King County. They wanted control over that. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we did was, uh, was we put a planted median um, together. So they were very proud of that. And that, uh, that effort to dress up the, the main arterial for the city was really a source of pride for the city. And uh, along the way, that wasn't the only thing that solved the problem. Um, yeah, catching the Green River Killer was helpful. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, they, uh, they did uh, create their own, uh, well, they didn't. They contracted with, with King County Sheriff for their policing services. But they put quite an emphasis on that. And, um, and so the policing improved. And so they were really proud of what they had done, what they called International Boulevard <coughs> and do today. So Sound Transit passed a bond, and their bond says, we're coming down the middle of your road. <laughs> and, and because of the layout of the airport, so airports are long and thin, and there aren't many ways across the airport. So they're very limited. So east-west access uh, was, was critical. And for things like fire trucks, because the trains were going to run every six minutes, which meant that every three minutes a train was stopping and they would have signal priority. I'm sorry to drag this on so long. But I'm giving you a sense of why it was very important to the city council. Um, and so when uh, I was there and, uh, and the, the council was very concerned that this regional agency was going to ram this plan, plan down our throats. And, and I really think that one of my strengths is that I... Uh, I, I have been successful, and the example I will finish with soon, um, in representing the city. We were a small city in a big urban area, you know, so uh, they, we didn't have a lot of respect from other jurisdictions. They were just going to do what they were going to do. And so when the council was deliberating, it's like, gosh, we really don't want this, this light rail to come down the middle of the road that we've rebuilt and reformed, so what can we do about it? Well, I, uh, and I'm, maybe I'm playing Tony's card here, I don't, or, um, uh, but I was a planner at the time. And so uh, there's an old line, and it goes, um, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Well, my tool was zoning. So I went to my planning director at the time. I was responsible for the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance amendments. I didn't do permits on a daily basis. And, um, and I went to him, and we said, well, can't we, uh, what are our zoning standards for light rail? Never heard of zoning standards for light rail, and we had some money, and we contracted with with a, a firm. I don't think it was CH2M Hill, but could have been, um, at, to give us some examples of light rail design standards around the United States. And the really, they, they gave us a few. They gave us some examples, enough to point out the the standards that we would prefer. And I won't bore you with those right now. But the bottom line is that we adopted some zoning standards for light rail, and I 
distinctly recall um, the time when I uh, got dragged into a meeting with the head of the light rail division of Sound Transit when he just blew a gasket and he said, I've been building light rail systems all over the world my entire career and nobody has ever adopted zoning standards for light rail. And I said, well, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> you know, it was my idea and I did make it happen. And the result of that is that they ended up building it, but it's 30 feet up in the air. Right, so if you go to SeaTac and you see that light rail out there, you can think of me because I will take you know, to my, my grave, the, the, what I think is my greatest success, which that cost Sound Transit $300 million. So this was not chump change. Mm -hmm. And we had to fight for that. And they challenged the zoning standards, and we had to go to court on that. And they, uh, we worked it through. And we ended up doing a development agreement with them. So mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't enforce all of our standards. Some of them were a bit overreach. Um, but what we did do is get them to the table Right, so that we negotiated with them and instead of being steamrolled by them. So that's what I would list as my greatest challenge. Did that answer both of your questions? Yes. <laughs> okay. So right. that community got to keep their highway in that sense of identity and pride that they uh, had in it. And and we did negotiate. Mm -hmm. And and we you know, it was clearly supported by the city council. We did have to go to court, but we it, it was ultimately configured to bring sound transit to the table so that we could negotiate mm -hmm. what we most needed and then in exchange we gave up some things which we didn't most need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and that was a bargaining process but it it was necessary simply because sound transit was just going to steamroll us i mean they had a whole you know regional bond and it's what it said and they were going <coughs> to comply with their bond and we said not in our city Sorry, yeah, but we can relate to being you got to play by our rules. <laughs> yeah, we can relate to this. Yes. Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mangelberg. Uh, as the city manager, how would you view your relationship with the city commission, and how would you go about building and maintaining a strong relationship? How would I gear it? Um, how would you view your view relationship? my relationship? Jill, so can you get my notebook, please? I forgot to bring it in from the car. Um, well, I, I, it's, it is very important to recognize that policies are made by a majority of the commission. Um, and, um, and so my goal and my, my primary role is to cycle back around and make sure that the commission uh, collectively supports policy initiatives. Um, now we have a lot of initiatives, some of them are embedded in law that we just have to perform. We have the budget committee and the process for establishing the budget. And there's a lot of things that we don't need to sort of, you know, revisit all the time. They're just part of the way we do business in Oregon, and that's, that's fine. Um, but the real challenges typically are initiatives. And so they're, uh, you know, the, the mayor goes out, speaks to a, uh, a citizen, um, <coughs> agrees that that's a good idea, that that's something that he would like to champion. Um, of course, he's not allowed to discuss it outside of a, a, a public meeting. Um, so, um, and I'm, I, I'm sure you are diligently adherent to that rule, something that my current council isn't quite as attentive to all the time. Uh, but that's, that's on them. And, um, and so my goal is to, uh, you know, in, when, when the mayor brings that proposal, thank you, uh, and wants to discuss it with me, great, and I'll try to flush it out. And it doesn't mean I'm doing it. It means that what we need to do is to prepare it so that the council and the public can evaluate it. And um, so you're naturally going to ask questions about how much it's going to cost. You're naturally going quest to ask questions about do we have the resources to accomplish that? Is it legal? Is it, uh, is it, how soon can we get it done? Um, I could give you examples, but I won't. Um, and so, and I would, and I use the mayor as an example uh, because he tends to be the, the spokesperson for the city, but you're all spokespersons for the city. People approach you and they want things done and you think they're good ideas. Um, I, uh, I, I will share a brief anecdote. Soon after I was elected to city council in 1985, um, the, uh, I was approached by a group who wanted, do you guys know what blinder racks are? Yeah, 
Well, blinder racks are uh, something that you, you may recognize, you just wouldn't know what their name is. And that is that if you see, uh, if, if you were to go into a store and see an adult magazine of some sort, mm. right, do you want to actually see the front cover? Or would you prefer to just know that it's there, but it has a cardboard cover in front of it? Right? That's mm. a blinder. And so you have blinder racks. And so there was a movement on the part of, of the <coughs> churches in the city to, um, to put blinder racks in front of all the magazines, uh, the adult magazines. And that was fine, in theory. Um, and I met with, uh, I met with some, some church leaders, and we talked about that. And, uh, and eventually they brought that proposal. I didn't. They did. They came to council, and they made their pitch, and they gave their some pretty horrendous horror stories about the effects of pornography on children and kids were grabbing these and the parents were walking into the magazine racks and their kids were standing there and it was, you know, uh, it was dramatic. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it was, um, uh, and I had already made a commitment, right? So when I met with them, I said, you know, I don't think that this is such a bad idea that, that I, I don't want, I won't want my kids to see it. Uh, you know, it's a pretty minor infringement from my perspective. Uh, I was wrong. Um, so, uh, but I was wrong because the city council pointed out to me the wrong-headedness of that approach. And the real problem came with the fact that we couldn't define what was uh, an adult magazine. I mean, you know it when you see it, sometimes. But how about those romance novels? Right? So romance novels can be pretty steamy on their covers, right? Are we going to cover up every romance novel? Are we getting, the enforcement was just a nightmare. And that, to me, is a great example of what I would do in working with the council in my own way. If, he, if, they'd had a, if I had been smart enough and educated enough and, and wise enough to go to the city manager at the time and had discussed that with him and potentially the city attorney, um, I, I think my attitude would have shifted considerably. Um, so you're all wise and experienced, and you'd never fall into that trap. Uh, but that I see as being the kind of, of role that I can play to help sort through these sort of risky challenges in order to make sure that what we're doing has, is feasible and that, you know, you all don't, don't step in a hole. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, enough said. Okay. So how would your reporting staff or your peers comment when asked about your leadership style your leadership strengths and your leadership weaknesses. What would this discussion tell us about you as a leader? Uh, well, uh, I think that um, my leadership style I would describe, and I think they would descri describe as collaborative. So, my um, I respect the department heads and the people who work for me and for you. Um, they, I, I came up through the ranks. Right. I started in 1979 making a whopping thousand bucks a month as a planner, and um, and I s essentially worked my way up just as just as Tony has worked his way up, and um, and so I've gone through most of the challenges that your staff has gone through at one level or another. I've never been a cop, so I've never had. <laughs> well, I actually have had a gun pulled on me, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, and. Um, uh, you know, so uh, there's, uh, I respect what they do. I'm, I know that I don't have their job. They have their job, and I need them to do it, and I need to respect them and provide the support that they need to do that. And that all comes up through the department heads to me. Um, if you respect the chain of command, then you don't break the chain of command casually. Um, and so I think you will also find that my department heads understand that that's true, uh, that I, I expect them to perform. I expect them to tell me what's going on. I expect them to get guidance when they need it. And I expect to give them support when I support it. Um, and when I don't support their positions, then I will let them know why and hopefully steer them into a path that I can support. That's not always true, um, but it's uh, it generally the case. And um, so that uh, what I do is I meet with I've said this enough times, I'm afraid I'll be repeating myself. I meet with uh, my department heads collectively on a weekly basis, had a meeting with my management team this morning. We went over upcoming agenda items, other issues that are sort of percolating out there that we need to, we need to have a common understanding of. Um, sometimes it means talking to one manager, and if that's true, I won't waste the time with the others. Um, but, but this morning was an example where we had a, a 
odd issue that required input from four of my managers simultaneously. They all had a little different perspectives. And we kicked that around and, and you know, did some assignments for additional work, and it, it really worked beautifully. Um, I also meet then weekly with my major department heads, so police, finance, planning, public works. Um, uh, my finance director is also my HR director and my risk manager, so I cover a lot of ground when I meet with him. Um, and we meet for an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. It's a regularly recurring schedule, and, and we go over that. Now, the reason that I asked to bring this in, let's see, where is it? Ah, it's under weekly, if you have guessed. So this gives you a sense. There's a staple when you need one. So anyway, I'll just pass this around. This is what I call my running report. And what it really is, is a punch list that I use with my department heads. And so it, it identifies the first item on that list is the council goal. And that council goal then is one that I have assigned as being relevant to that department. A lot of goals aren't relevant to all departments. So we keep that uppermost on the list. Um, then we have just other items that have been challenges that have been concerns that we've had. There have been workload items that I think will take some of their time. Um, and we, we modify that collectively on a pretty regular basis. So I'll go through all those to them. If you see an item that's bolded, that's considered to be uh, <coughs> to highlight my attention when I'm talking to them so that we make sure that we cover that item. Some of them, there's a lot of items. So you can't cover all of it. Uh, but uh, so we meet and we go over that and um, that's what I call gnawing the bone, is that you just keep gnawing it. You know, it doesn't go away, you just keep working it and working it and working it. These, a lot of these things take months, even years to accomplish. So you have to keep working the issue. And of course the council goals change on occasion and, um, and you know, we, we keep working that issue. So it's, uh, it's collaborative because it's, it, it, uh, yes, I have, I have a position in the chain of command, and, I, and everybody knows that. I don't need to remind them of that. Um, what I do need is for them to cooperate, and I do need for us to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. And so that is, I am quite confident that my uh, management team would say that really is my style. That is what we do every week, week in and week out. Yes, I have their annual reviews. Yes, we, you know, we go through all of the formalities that we have to do to manage your staff. And on rare occasions, um, that requires some, uh, I'll loosely call it discipline, but you know, you, you, you need to bring up things to people. If they keep hitting some of these items and I say they're important and that nothing gets done and nothing gets done and nothing gets done, I'm gonna let them know that. They're gonna know that I know. They will have known because we've gone over it every week. Mm -hmm. You know, they know what they aren't doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I want them to tell me what they aren't doing. And why? Because there may be very good reasons for it. So I think, uh, is there something in that question that I should, that I didn't answer? Uh, how would your reporting staff and your peers mm -hmm. comment when asked about your leadership style, collaborative, your leadership strengths? Uh, I think collaborative leadership is a strength. And my leadership weaknesses. Um, I, I think probably my biggest weakness indirectly is my experience and and I mean that sincerely in that um, I've been through enough issues that uh, my tendency is to assume um, sometimes the facts that that bear on the problem and sometimes the solutions you know if you only the only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So when you've, uh, you, when you've had a similar issue occur five times in your career, your temptation is to say, well, it's just like that time that we did this before. And so I try to offset that weakness by talking, by talking to the, my management team, by talking to the council, by trying to better understand and not jump to conclusions. Um, and it's, that's, that's a trap that I've had to manage. Mr. Pauly? To what extent do you believe contact with citizens and citizen groups is important? How do you typically handle this responsibility and how will you build relationships with the community? Well, of course it's important. Um, I, I, there's only so much time. 
right? And that's true for all of you too, right? Do you go to every advisory committee meeting? No. I expect my department heads to be staffing advisory committee meetings and to be feeding back to me what they've heard. I review minutes of uh, advisory committee meetings and groups. I attend meetings. Um, I think my wife spoke to that last night. I'm gone a lot. I'm gone a lot because I'm going to functions and I'm chatting with people. I have a good relationship in particular with the, the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce and several, um, several of their members who we work together to solve problems and to do that we have to keep talking. Um, major developers that, I, that, that I'm engaged with, um, I talk to as well. But then there's also the people who see the opportunity to develop differently. And so my door is open. Um, it, it doesn't get abused, um, but um, you know, it, if I'm meeting with somebody, I had two council members wander in on, on Friday. Now I know that's not the public overall, but it was unscheduled and I broke into to, you know, the meeting that I had and I met with them. I would not typically do that for the public, so the best way to get a hold of me is I'm, I'm really good at email. I like email, um, the public is welcome to email me, and I've had a standard throughout my entire career um, that I respond to every email and every voicemail within 24 hours. Um, and that does not mean I give them the answer. We had a gentleman today who emailed and he wanted us to create a report for him. Right, well, it's not our staff's duty to prepare custom reports for people, right? And there's a public records request and they can ask for the record but if the record doesn't exist then you know that's a little bit different duty um, but the what I do and what I expect my department heads to do and overall staff to do is to respond so we won't give him his the, the record he's requested but we will respond saying thank you Paul we've got your your email uh, we're, we're looking at it um, and if we know that in fact we won't provide that report we'll we'll tell him that and if we think we can and will, I left it up to my finance director to decide whether or not he would actually prepare the report. It's his time that in this case will apply. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I go to public meetings and, uh, and interact with the leaders of public groups um, on an as-needed basis, and I do that, and I've always done that. Um, so I, I think I probably answered that adequately. Commissioner Smith. Um, scenario it says the city budget forecast is tending negative within the next five years. Explain what tips or what, excuse me, except explain which steps um, you would take to mitigate or prevent this from happening. Well, um, this is the city of Troutdale. So there we are. Our budget forecast is tending negatively. Uh, within for the next five years and that's because we uh, are slightly overspending um, uh, of course budgets and I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this too so when you create a budget typically you underspend the budget um, but not always so you you uh, you conservatively estimate revenues and you uh, more liberally uh, estimate expenses so when you adopt a budget there's a tendency to see it you know diverging um, at the end of the year however it's surprising how often that comes together because the conservative aspect of your budgeting uh, results in the fact that you may have more ending fund balance at the end of the year than you had budgeted and that's great and that has been true for uh, my uh, certainly my experience in Troutdale with the exception of the first year when it was you know we were still in decline what I have done um, is uh, we I take a uh, what I'll loosely call a break-even budget by which I mean that we uh, we we make it clear in the budget what uh, our revenues will be for the year and therefore what we can afford if we're not going to dip in the ending fund balance so it's overt, it's transparent, it's clear. The problem with that is that there's always a wish list. Mm -hmm. And and wish list is a is oversimplifies it, right? These are these are always important projects. They're important to somebody. And um, and generally they're important to the council because or the commission because you're my bosses. So I listen carefully if there's a, a, a project that you'd really like to see done and we try to budget it accurately and reasonably with stated assumptions uh, but 
you know, we, we need a carry forward budget. So we need to figure out how we're going to continue to do the things we've been doing. Now, we don't have to do that. We can always say, we, you know, uh, public safety is always your, your largest expense, so we can slash public safety budget. How does that go? Had any luck with that lately? <laughs> um, uh, and maybe you have. Uh, we did. But we, we, our solution was probably not one that I would recommend here, and that is that we uh, merged our police department with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, who's providing the service. That's saving us a half a million dollars a year. That will balance our budget into the future considerably. Um, but it was a unique situation, and I won't go into the mechanics of that, but it was not something that one could expect to just go to the sheriff and say, hey, you know, let's go for it. The, uh, the, my police chief came to me about two years ago, sat down with me and said, you know, Craig, we can, we can improve level of service by taking this approach. And I said, well, great, but we already have great level of service. We're really proud of our police. They're doing a great job. Uh, so come back to me with how you can save me money. Then we'll talk. Because until I get that, until I can make an argument, it'll save money. And that drove the conversation, not unlike my conversation with Sound Transit. You know, that, that focused people on what I felt was most critical. It, we had to maintain level of service. If we can improve it, that's great. We improved it. Um, and uh, we had, have 24-hour counter coverage in the PD, which we didn't have before. We have lease revenue coming in for the police department building that we never had before. We, uh, we have more cops on the street. We had 28 commission officers uh, at the time this year, the, the police chief first came to me. We are paying for 16 now. That's how we save a half million dollars a year. Um, that was an opportunity and I took it and ran with it and I think steered it into a productive way. Now, obviously, you have two aspects in the budget and that's revenue and expenses. So you can pair the revenue or you can, you can increase the revenues. Uh, we did pass a gas tax. You guys have your utility fee that you're looking at for the for the PD, um, and but it took us years to get there. We have a um, a council policy now that they're going. To, we're going to increase utility rates four percent a year because for years they didn't change them, and uh, and as a result, you know we're looking at we're looking at our at our utility uh, financing just going down the tubes, and four percent isn't going to get us there. And so we, we presented other alternatives to the, to the council. Um, they're evaluating them now, and they have already adopted some. Um, and so that's, again, you know, it's sort of, you keep, you keep grinding away at the issues. They don't go away. You can't balance the budget by wishing it, you know, to get better. And there's only two ways to do it. You cut the expenses or you, uh, you increase revenues, and both are painful. Uh, but I do express in the budget sort of what the break-even is. And uh, early in my career, I, I've got an MBA, so I'm sort of bottom line driven. And I said, doggone it, I am, I am clearly going to show which items on the which, wish list I think are the highest priorities. And therefore, you know, when you get to that point in your budget where this is your revenue, projected revenue for the year, and here's... <laughs> Council members wish list number four, five, six, seven, eight. My councils didn't appreciate that, I discovered. <laughs> uh, because it was always somebody that, that you know got, got hurt. It was their idea. And who am I to prioritize their 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 ideas? Right? And it's true. And so I've uh, backed away from that somewhat. And what I really do is I'm looking at where the the continuation carry forward budget to keep doing things the way we've been doing, how that compares and how much is left. And then there's, there's this much left and there's this much on the wish list. And the council has to decide, the budget committee has to decide what gets put into that until we're breaking. And every year they go below that. I mean, they spend more money uh, because their wish lists are important. And uh, forgive me, I keep demeaning it by using that term, but I think it's, you know what I mean. And um, and, and so those are uh, my approaches to budgeting, and, uh, and it's been, uh, you know, it's great that the economy's improving. That's a wonderful thing, and, uh, you know, but we, we managed, and uh, we've, got, we've got more money in ending fund balance than we had when I started, and yet we've done a lot of good things, and uh, we have not laid off any staff. They laid off 10% the year before I got there, so 
the, the previous manager sort of you know, made it a little easier for me. Uh, but but the councils had to had to you know they've they've had to dip into savings and there's some anxiety about that. So they and I will finish this quickly, Mayor. Um, but the uh, one of the things that my council has done the last couple of years has been very effective is in a mid-year budget committee, which we, I, well, you've got a biennial budget, so your situation is a bit different. But we go to the budget committee, we tell them where we are for the year, and they give staff direction as to how much ending fund balance, if any, we can budget into the budget that comes out in April. Um, and they've done that. Last year was $150,000. We were $400,000 in the black. Even though we could spend 150 of reserves, we, we were half a million dollars above that at the end of the year. And um, that's because we, we budget conservatively, which is appropriate. And, and that's, that's helping. And we've got, we've got quite a little wish list coming up this year. So, there you Mr. Mangaberg. One of our current challenges is the need for new or remodeled facilities. Uh, what is your experience in solving staff space issues and facility needs? Well, I, I, I doubt that there's any uh, magic formula here, so I, I don't think I'm going to, you know, uh, wow you with something that you have never thought of. Um, it really comes down to talking to the staff. So we need to do a, uh, you know, we need to understand what the department's needs are, both for their sort of functions as they are. The, the, the adjacencies are very important. Um, and uh, and we, uh, at, we're doing this now for City Hall. Um, our, our City Hall, was I mentioned last night, was collapsing on top of the council. And so we abandon it, and we lease space, which is a buck a year, which is a buck a square foot, I'm sorry, uh, per month. And, you know, that's a challenge for us. But we have to, uh, you know, we have to take seriously the opportunity to build a new city hall. And so we, we went back. We hired an architect who knows their business. We did the uh, calculations with input from the departments about what we need to do. Um, the answer was we needed a 23,000-square-foot city hall. The city council said, you get a 15,000 square foot city hall. Um, and I know who I work for, and we will make that work. I'm not sure how yet, but we will. Um, and, uh, but one of the, one of the, uh, one of my ambitions uh, for a city hall, and I think that applies to you all too, is um, you don't have to get everybody in city hall, but I really want a permit center. I really want, and I encourage you to think seriously about putting your your public works engineers who handle permits, your building and your planning department together. If it's in City Hall, great. If it isn't in City Hall, put it somewhere else, but get them together. Because when the developer comes in, and of course we all know, developers span a huge range, right? You've got the Blue Heron site, and the developer for that is not going to be the same person who wants to build a shed in their backyard. But they are both developers. And they both come in for permits, and they both need answers to their questions. And in fact, it's the big developer who will probably be more tolerant um, because they will do their homework and they've done enough projects that they understand the development process. The person who wants to build a shed in their backyard, they don't know and they don't want a permit. They don't want you to even ask for a permit. You know? So you've got to handle everybody at the counter. And you have to have the staff there who is equipped uh, both mentally and and you know professionally technically to work with that range and um, and so I, I think that that's an important uh, you know that that's my wish list for a city hall or one of the items um, so that's uh, that's where I start I start with the staff we look at adjacencies we look at the things that we think are most important for for uh, serving the public ultimately. Um, but the staff morale is important and the staff efficiency is important and, uh, and the cost of the building and those are all important. And um, so we, what part of your question did I ask or did I answer? Oh, now here's a, a, a bit different approach. Um, I'm working on a city hall design right now. We did a $7 million police facility in 2011 on time, on budget not easily accomplished um, and frankly I take some credit because I also built a fire station in SeaTac which had real challenges 
Um, it was well over budget. The reason it was over budget, the major driver, is that we were building it in 2007, 2006, 2007, when China was going nuts and the price of steel went through the roof. And we didn't budget that going in. So all of a sudden, as we're getting ready to buy the steel, we found out we were paying a premium for it and we hadn't budgeted it and that hurt. And, uh, but even in that case, I went back to the council. Right? We took our numbers, our estimates. We asked them if there were any solutions. Should we downsize <coughs> it? Should we, you know, use use you know wooden laminated beams instead of steel? Should we, you know? And they said, no, nope, stick to your guns, Greg. We're good with this. It's we'll explain to the public. All right. <laughs> I should, probably should have done a better job explaining it to the public because there was definitely some frustration about that. But uh, a, a, an important lesson from that, and the lesson that I applied from that to the police station is that we broke the project into phases, and we had construction management general contractor, CMGC, approach that we used um, that uh, should have worked better than it did. Um, but ultimately, we saved the project because we broke it into three packages, and when it was going badly with the, the general contractor in the first phase, we were able to stop the work before the second phase and hire a different general contractor who did make it work. And also, we had a bunch of uh, projects at the end which were uh, sort of, uh, we, we broke into A, B, and C lists. So the A were the things you really had to have to make the building work. You know, you got to have the lights. Right, and you've got to. But these are things that we weren't going to pay the general contractor to do. Our staff, was, our facilities people, were going to go out and they were going to buy them and they were going to install them, and um, and that was great. So we had the A list, got to have. We had the B list, we'd really like to have, and then we have the C list. If we got any money left over, we'll do these things too. That was completely critical to of succeeding on that project. And I've advised your chief this and and already in the interviews because. Uh, what we were able to do when we started to realize that we had those cost overruns in the first phase is that by the time we got to the second phase, we didn't spend the money on the A, B, and C list quickly. And on the A list, we rationalized it and we made sure that what we were doing was cost effective and would work well, even though it wasn't as quite as gold-plated as we started with. Um, the B list, we, we didn't buy at all for a long time until we were sure that the A list was done and we were on budget. Then we did the B list. And the C list, in some cases, still isn't done. But for instance, we were building a police station for 50 years. Do you really need to buy 50 years of build out of the lockers in the locker room for staffing 50 years from now? Right? So there are holes in the, you know, in the locker room space there now because we didn't buy 50 years worth of, of lockers. We bought enough of the staff that we have now, and we'll come back in later and buy the rest, and that could become a problem. But so uh, we also did a public workshop. Uh, we did a we we moved into a building when I was in SeaTac, and we did a uh, a renovation of an existing office building for our city hall. Um, I was a part of a player in those. I wasn't city manager at the time, so I won't take too much credit. But I was involved from the staff standpoint of what it took to try to you know, bring all the pieces together to do something that was feasible. So I, I would say I have a lot of experience with facility development. Okay. Commissioner Shaw. Craig, uh, Oregon City residents make up over 50% of the customers of the Tri-City Sewer Service oh. District. Yeah. <laughs> Bam. However, governance of the district is controlled not by the cities, but by the county. How do you suggest this inequity be communicated to our citizens? Well, I guess I would start with a white paper about um, what we perceive to be the inequities. And so do uh, research that, make sure that it's, uh, that it's fair. We don't want, uh, we don't want the, the county to come back and uh, you know, start challenging little sort of nitpicky points about how we negotiated <coughs> this or we mischaracterized that. Um, so it's got to be a solid piece of professional work to to point out what we believe are the inequities to Oregon City. Um, that's how I'd start. Okay. So uh, we're fastest answer yet. We're yeah. yeah, fifty minutes in, and we've probably got maybe twenty minutes left, and we're not quite halfway through the question. So as Chris Wallace is likely to say, let's 
do a lightning round. So okay. I'm going to start with question 10, which is the commission has placed a sewer moratorium in effect for certain parts of the city. Please explain the thought process that you'd use in drafting communications to address the continuing concerns of developers affected by the moratorium. Well, what they want, what they will want to know is when is it going to end and how much is it going to cost them. And so we need to we need to have a plan that says how we're going to address it and when we're going to be able to answer those questions. Not unlike my answer earlier about how I deal with uh, with citizen complaints. You know, you don't necessarily have to have the answer right now, but you do have to maintain your communication, and that's what they're going to want to know. And um, that's that's what I would focus on. Okay. Commissioner Smith? Um, what is your vision of a successful tourism program uh, for Oregon City? It's a big question, but. <laughs> well, it's like your hotmails. This is, this is going to be a lightning round, huh? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I've, right now, in my experience, we've had, I've had two tourism operations um, and one of them was is way out of scale for what you guys have because city of SeaTac has 5,000 hotel rooms and brings in a million dollars in lodging tax every year so we could do a lot but when we did a lot we didn't do it alone we did it in a partnership with a in that case it was a regional chamber of commerce where we pooled funds with adjacent cities and their lodging tax uh, Tukwila, Burien, I won't bother you with the names but we had a compact where we work together to create a visitor information bureau. It's called Seattle Southside. Nobody knows where SeaTac is. <coughs> Nobody knows where C you know Southgate and King County is. All they care about is getting to Seattle. So it was pointless to not just assume that name at some form, and that we did that strategically. And um, uh, so we we pooled our efforts. Now. Uh, Troutdale has a bit of a different model, um, but we tried and, and are really doing the same thing. The problem that we have is that Troutdale has all the hotel rooms. The, there are some hotels, small hotels in Fairview and Wood Village, but they don't charge lodging tax. So we give $70,000 a year, um, a dedicated portion of our lodging tax, not all of it, to the Chamber of Commerce to run a visitor center. And it's located in Troutdale, and as long as we're given 70% of the money, it's going to stay in Troutdale. Um, and they do as good a job as they can. $70,000 doesn't take you very far, right? But it does give you a building. It does give you a place where people can pull out the freeway and go in and ask questions. And it's reasonable. They would like more money, and every year they come back <coughs> and ask for more money to do, um, you know, a better web presence, for instance, where you can actually, which we did in SeaTac, you can go on Seattle South Side and you can book the hotel room on their site. That was a lot more important a few years ago when we started that than it is now. Now you can go on all kinds of websites and book, you know, hotel rooms. So I think the competitive advantage of that approach has, has softened considerably. Um, but the important thing is, is you got a human being who can answer their questions and make them feel welcome, and that's it, it, that's where I'd start. And we'll see how far the money runs out. And if you can do it with a collective effort, um, then you can you can uh, you know you can get more bang for the buck. But then you get more bucks, hopefully. On Good. the other hand, you've only got one hotel in, in Oregon City, from what I understand. Right so now, yeah. I'm not sure how you would. I guess you maybe do a partnership with West Lynn and you know Gladstone. And I mean, <laughs> I I don't know the geography in the cities well enough to jump to those conclusions yet. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mengelberg. Uh, what do you do when you uh, when your views of handling the situ situation differ from those of the commission as a whole? Um, I try to lay out clearly what the uh, what the I'll call it the program is that the Commission expects to be accomplished and then I will uh, relay that to the staff and we will organize ourselves around accomplishing that purpose um, I, I I will keep it short here but I gave you an example last night it came up in a question that I got um, regarding tree retention it's not something that I was passionate about. I actually personally objected to it. My council seemed to be really committed to it. And, uh, you know, off we went doing it. They changed their mind, but, uh, you know, they were well within their rights. And uh, we did our best to, to accomplish that purpose until they changed their mind. And then we did our best not to accomplish that purpose. 
So did you try, in that situation, in the beginning, did you try to express your feelings about? Yes. Okay. Yes, I met privately with council members and I let them know my personal reaction to this and my professional reaction because when you adopt a new code, it's got to be enforced. And, you know, if you're not going to enforce it, if the, if the idea is that it's going to feel good to do it and you tell people you're going to do it, but you really don't want to do it, you know, you don't want it enforced, then don't do it because it just creates confusion and, and, uh, and misallocates our staff resources into a dead end. Okay. So yes, I did. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Pauly. Can you describe an ethical issue that you've had to deal with in your career and how you handled it? Um, yes and no. Uh, it, it, I'm sorry, I shouldn't joke about these things. Um, well, uh, the, the toughest issue, how do I do this in lightning? Um, the uh, mayor kite. I, I don't. I think he was gone before you. Uh, you became He's mayor. Not gone before I know what's going on yes. in the political realm well, across the region. Do you all know? <laughs> can I save that story? Well, mayor, sure. mayor kite. Uh, I, I, from my perspective, abused his power to um, uh, to. He built an accessory dwelling unit behind his house. Co-op oh, staff <laughs> into permitting a shed. <laughs> Yeah. And the shed looks a lot like a house, <laughs> and it has a full basement in the Sandy River floodplain. And um, yeah, and no, uh, and my my <laughs> building about I would guess it was about seven or eight months after I became city manager, uh, my building official and my planning director came to me and said, you know, Craig. And by the way, I learned an important lesson from that. When I first showed up on the job, they said, you know, Craig, there are some things you don't want to know about, and I believe them. Oh, bad Jeez. idea. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they did eventually come to me a few <laughs> months later and they said, well, you know, we haven't told you about this, but by the way, we permitted this. And, and it's now creating a problem. He wants a certificate of occupancy to actually move in and we're not sure that it complies with the code and, you know, it's a worry. And I said, look, wait, 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 does it comply with the code? You know, and these are several codes. It's the flood code, it's the building code, it's the zoning code. You know, does it comply? And they said, well, yeah, it, it does. Sort of. And I said, well, if it complies, then you have to issue the certificate of occupancy. Right? If it doesn't, then you should have never issued the original permits to right. begin with. It complies, great. It's good. Yeah. Well, the city council, because it looked a lot like a house, required me to conduct an investigation. We did that. The investigation uh, actually disclosed documents that were unknown to us. For instance, there was a original plan that said bedroom, bedroom, kitchen that was revised to be submitted saying office, office, wet bar. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, so there were just, and that, uh, my, my planning and building department did not know that, right? So the investigation was actually fundamental to, to in uncovering the fact that this was a sham. Um, but there were other issues, and so it was it was quite a challenge because the city was not, uh, you know, my my staff made mistakes. My none of the, the neither my planning uh, director nor my building official are still working for the city of Trotdale. Um, both of them resigned. It's a long process to get them to the point of resigning. Um, but they did eventually get there and they got a minor severance and they moved on and they're both employed in Clackamas County. Uh, no, I'm sorry, one in Clackamas <laughs> County and one in Multnomah County at the moment. It wouldn't surprise me if they're Clackamas County, but. <laughs> and uh, and we, um, we, we red tagged the building with the new building official and, we, um, and the building is almost uh, if they file all of the paperwork, will be completely compliant with the building code, the flood, plan, uh, the flood code, and the zoning code. It took a process to get the mayor around on that. And that was a challenge because he was, he was my boss. He was the mayor when this whole thing started. And it was, it was an ethical challenge. And it was an ethical challenge because our staff had not been, you know, their, their hands were a little dirty in this too mm -hmm. from my perspective. And so we had to conduct the investigation in good faith, and we didn't know where it was going to go. I dragged in the state building department, uh, FEMA, the, the you know DEQ came in. Um, uh, FEMA actually region the region did an investigation, um, and all of them found that the building was non-compliant. And that, so we we did the right thing. We followed through, and we've got the right outcome. But it was painful and 
<laughs> expensive. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Shaw. What kind of relationship <coughs> do you want to have with the management team and the rest of the staff, and how will you establish it? Collaborative. And, um, oh, come on, somebody smile. You're so busy, right? Um, <laughs> Just trying to figure out how to spell that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a, it's a two-sided coin, and one of them is that uh, it, there is a chain of command. They know who the boss is. I know who the boss is. There's sort of a rule of thumb in the military. If you have to pull rank, then you're, you're uh, doing something wrong. Right? That, that it should never get to the point of having to pull rank on somebody. That people should, you should be communicating, working together. They know what you want. They know who you are. They know what they need to do to keep you happy, just as I feel about all of you. Know, and uh, to do that, we've got to talk a lot, and to, and so I, I've already given my, my recipe for, for uh, dealing with that. Um, the same thing is true for staff. Um, I, I, an example I use is I had, I think I may have shared it, that I had a, a lady who was a parks worker. She had been assigned a, a project of running um, some city events that obviously use parks. Um, the, she. I would loosely say abuse that privilege of you know, she was working out of class, she started to boss around some of her coworkers, they weren't happy about it, they complained, the public works director pulled her off of that project and with full knowledge by me. So I wasn't surprised until she walked into my office and she was really upset, um, good person, hard worker, wanted to do the right thing, felt that that, that was the, the highlight of her job was working in this assignment and I got all of that and I, and she cried which was you know hard to take and um, and and we talked and I said you know look I, I thank you for letting me know I'm sorry that you feel so you know pained by this um, I had spoken to the public works director of, who runs our parks um, and I will talk to him again and express your your concerns and how you feel um, but it's his call to run his department and I am not going to override that and break the chain of command on her behalf. And, um, and lo and behold, while she was angry with me for a while, she went back. She's running that program right now, happy as clam. And, um, and I, I think that it, by holding the line, expressing what I did, I did go back to the public works director. I did everything. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty faithful at doing what I say I'm going to do. I'm a little reluctant to promise to do things sometimes because I really want to deliver. And if I can't deliver, then I don't want to promise to deliver. Um, but in that case, I did everything I needed to do, and she learned. And we're trusting her to do that again, and we haven't had a recurrence to those problems. So. Okay. How would you go about building or rebuilding a positive relationship with other governments with whom there has been conflict in the past? Well. My approach has always been, I, I, I mentioned that I was, I was on the point for the previous <coughs> attack with the third runway, battle, and it was a battle. And, um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I, first off, I took the hit, you know. I mean, I had, I had people, you know, criticize me in meetings because I was there representing C. Tacky and, you know, all these things, and believe me, it still hurts. And um, cute line, though. And, um, uh, you know, and, and so I, I tried to not react when they took it personally, and that's really what was going on, is that, you know, they felt really passionate against the third runway, and our city wasn't playing ball with them, and, and so we were wrong. And anybody who was presenting that, that face to them must also be wrong, and, you know, it's like, look, I work for the city council. The city council's position is to mitigate, not litigate. Sorry, you want to litigate. That's not where we're going. We're going to solve our problems working with the Port of Seattle. We did that behind closed doors through an intergovernmental agreement, at, at exactly how it was laid out. But I treated them as professionals, and I expected them to treat me as a professional. And once they came to understand that I wasn't going to retaliate, I tried to not take it personally, that you know, I'm a pro, and, and it's okay to represent your agency's point of view. It's okay. That's what you're there for. That's what I'm doing. Do it. But, you know, be a grown-up about it. And, um, 
And so that's, <laughs> I, I would just deal with the issues and try to work with those individuals until they understand. I, I was the lead negotiator on a fire contract with the city of Gresham for Fairview and Wood Village um, uh, last year. And that was a big deal and it was, it was a problem. And, um, and you know, I had to sit down with, with the, the fire chiefs and the city manager of, uh, of Gresham and I had to lay out what I viewed as our group's priorities and when they started to throw arguments at me and justifications that I felt were were invalid I they knew that I felt they were invalid but I did it in a polite way I just sort of countered it I said well that's not how we see it so here's how we see it and I got a compliment the other day when the, the fire chief of Gresham saw that I was applying here and he you know, wrote me a very pleasant little email and you know, so I I think I'm pretty good at doing that Got a lot of experience doing that. Okay. Commissioner Mengelberg. Um, describe your experience obtaining grants. What agencies would you approach for grants? What kinds of grants do you think would benefit Oregon City? Well, uh, transportation grants are always important. Transportation is always an issue. It has a way of, of sort of, you know, figuring into every aspect that you do. Um, there are also uh, grants for water system improvement, sewer system improvement. Um, uh, there are grants for arts. There are grants for um, uh, what else here? Yeah, I have, arts are an interesting thing, and I wanted to ask you, but I'll ask when I get to the Q and A if I have any time left. Um, uh, there was a time when um, I spent a lot of energy looking at state and federal grants uh, for a variety of things back when there were earmarks those were the days <laughs> um, and that's that's very hard to get these days we've got uh, uh, we've had, had great luck getting brownfield grants I don't know how relevant that is to you and the cove and and the landfill um, and you know projects like that um, uh, the, the state has been good about that and we have been uh, using the regional solutions team approach to uh, grants sort of overstate the case but I think it's it's a great example of something that Oregon is doing very well which is if you can get on their priority list and I'll bet you guys have at least a couple projects on the priority list for them you know keep working them and they will look for grants for you and they will look for funding opportunities and we have had great luck doing that so that's my quick and dirty Bobby Lee's on speed dial on my phone. So. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, <laughs> Bobby Lee knows me too. So you can call him up and ask him about me. Uh, Commissioner Shaw. All right. <clears throat> if you are selected as the successful candidate and understanding that pay and benefits are matters of negotiation, tell us in broad terms what sort of compensation package you would expect. I make 135000 now. I, will, uh, I was attracted partially to this job because of the upper limit. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, let's start with the upper limit and go from there. Um, but I, I, that's tongue in cheek. I'm sorry. I, I know. That's all right. Know, I'm <laughs> trying to not be too, you know, we do too a, tough here. We do a little bit of that around here. So. I bet you do. Occasionally, yeah. yeah. Let's hope it comes to that point. I'll be happy to chat about it. Uh, about the contract yeah okay thank you okay um, I guess this is the second piece of this uh, given our most recent experience what kind of severance package would you expect if you were terminated well my counsel tonight is reviewing my contract to put in a year severance whether they will do that or not is another issue my contract there currently has six months okay essentially uh, you know, my counselor came to me and said, Craig, we'd really hate to lose you right now. And I said, well, you know, I'm very interested in Oregon City and um, make me want to stay. And that's... Uh, Where did we hear that before? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry to be so predictable. And, uh, but, you know, we'll see where it goes. And, okay. uh, and so that's, that's where, where I am right now. So I'll combine the last two. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell us and are there any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, well, I, I am really interested in the job. I was interested before and disappointed that I didn't land it. You know, I'm still here. 
Um, if I uh, don't get the offer this time, I'm not going to apply again. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I've got um, uh, quite a few years left. I probably will be, uh, be in a uh, you know, city manager role for another seven or eight years, um, uh, well past the average term for most city managers. Um, so I don't think you need to be worried about that. We would, I am most interested in Oregon City because of what I think of as the legacy opportunities here. And, um, you know, the, the uh, Willamette Falls project is one, the Cove is another. Um, the, your annexation <coughs> areas are uh, of interest to me. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the city, pro the facility projects are of interest to me. All of those are fun projects that later on, like I said, you know, I get a lot of pride in going to SeaTac and seeing that light rail system up near. I know it's there because I, I, you know, was there. And that, I like that. I like being able to point to my kids and my grandkids that I had something to do with that. that I'm proud of that stuff. And, uh, you know, and I'd like to be proud of the things that we can do here, too. So um, that, that probably hits most of the issues you're likely to ask about. I was going to ask you about community enhancement fee. So how do you spend that money? Metro community enhancement fee? Well, for the metro enhancement fee is, is, a, is a function of the tipping charge um, at, the, at the transfer station. And there is a, a set of guidelines that we've agreed to between the city and metro. Um, and so the, that comes before the quote Metro Enhancement Committee. Um, people come to that committee and ask for grants based on. So it's on well that. well defined process. Yeah. That oh yes. Have. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and well, good to know. We're looking at the same thing right now. And uh, and my council wrestled hard over whether or not to to have our own committee. And when Metro said, if you don't have your own committee, we'll do it for you. And that was the surest way of getting us <laughs> to do it. And, uh, but we haven't figured out how to do that yet. So we're still going through a bit of a battle. So I'll be, be happy to look on your, your website and, and, well, and learn from you. It's the you're always, itself. You, and you're always welcome to have staff contact our staff, and they'd be more than happy to cooperate with you and help them with that program. Any other questions? OK, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, it. Very much. Thank you right. so much. Right. I'm honored by the opportunity, and I hope we have a chance to keep talking. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. And by the way, I, I, I complimented. Uh, So we're running a little late, but we'll just uh, get right to it. Mr. Shaw. Welcome, Mr. Conkle. Um, why are you the best candidate for the Oregon City Manager position? Well, I think that I am the best candidate for the City Manager position here in Oregon City. Um, based on the experience that I've had here over the last 14 and a half years. Um, I came in right out of graduate school and started as an assistant planner in Oregon City. I worked my way up to the community development director, uh, which I've been for over the last five years leading the planning and building department. Over that time, I've served as the city manager pro tem on several occasions, as well as since last August um, in that role. Um, I think that the experience in community development allows you um, to have contacts with not only multiple departments, the, the, action, the activities we take on in planning have impacts in public works, in finance, um, and we need to be able to work with those and understand what decisions we're making in planning have on those infrastructure as well as what our infrastructure needs are. Um, through the community development department, I've also had the opportunity to work with a lot of our citizens. 
um, reaching out with the citizen involvement committee, the, natu the um, na neighborhood associations, working with the Optimist Club, the Chamber, Oregon City Business Alliance, um, Oregon City Downtown Association. I've also been in front of or staffed uh, and made presentations to Natural Resource Committee, Historic Review Board, Planning Commission, obviously the City Commission. So I think it gives me a great breadth and understanding of the activities of the city, the goals of the city, as well as an understanding of the concerns that the citizens have and how do we actively listen to that and try to address those. I think one of the other things is I know one of the concerns that's been brought up is that I've never been a city manager before. Um, but I would also say that with the experiences that I've had, I think I have experience that very few city managers in the state of Oregon have. I was the city manager pro tem when Officer Lipke was murdered. I was put in as the pro tem when Mr. Frazier separated from the city. And I was the pro tem at their last event uh, with the landslide. So I think that I've demonstrated my leadership skills, my ability to make decisions, uh, my ability to continue to keep the city running while we have major significant events occurring, as well as communicating that not only with the staff, uh, but with the elected officials as well. So I believe those do make me qualified to be the city manager for Oregon City. Commissioner Smith. Um, please explain what you believe the role of our city manager should be. Well, our role as the city manager uh, is really communicating with the elected officials, implementing the goals and policies that they've adopted, and administering the daily operations of this community that, w that, w that I would oversee, working with and making sure that the goals and priorities are being completed, providing oversight and direction to the directors and the executive team for them to implement with their management and staff. I also think it's very important that the city manager is able to not micromanage what is happening. It is having come up through the ranks, starting um, as an assistant planner, I have an amazing appreciation for the amount of work that gets done in this city by our staff. Um, and making sure that there's effective communication with them is so important. Making sure that they understand what the goals and policies of the commission are. Making sure what direction we're heading. And, and why we're going that way, having that communication, having an open door. And also, we have an amazing executive team of very talented professionals. We have a great management team. And they have expertise and knowledge that I do not have. And making sure that I am able to have that communication with them, that they're, they're, that they're comfortable coming with, with ideas. How are we going to solve this? Um, and listening to that and, and really working on a consensus base. Our library director could have some ideas or an event that she went through that we're discussing about public works and making sure that we hear all that, that everything's not siloed in a department, um, I think is very, very important. And then obviously I think that communication with our citizens. Um, I think that what I've seen is we accomplish some great things, but we don't necessarily get that information out to the citizens all the time in a very effective manner, in a consistent manner. So I think that's an opportunity that, that we've missed. And I'd hopefully, if I get this opportunity, could improve on that. Because building trust, showing them that we're spending their tax dollars wisely, we've got the Carnegie going, we have CSAFE moving forward. Those are really great projects that we're actually implementing rather than just talking about. So I, I do see that as my role as a city manager, is making sure that communication and relationships and concerns are, are heard, actively listening to what we're hearing. Commissioner Pauly. The Willamette Falls Legacy Project, you know this, is a tremendous <laughs> development <laughs> opportunity for Oregon City with many stakeholders. Uh, provide at least one um, example how you have previously created an agreement, shared purpose with all stakeholders to develop a successful community project, what was your greatest challenges and how did you overcome them? And conversely, what was your greatest success? And this totally applies to you, <laughs> since you've done this. <laughs> well, I guess I will use the Willamette Falls Legacy Project as an example, but I, I, I think it's been an evolution. I think one of, the, one of the most amazing things about this project is how we've been able to solidify not only working with multiple other government agencies with Clackamas County, with Metro, with the state, and even up to the federal level mm -hmm. to coalesce around one message and four values. Mm -hmm. 
And that has been mm -hmm. so, it, for a project of this complexity at its location, the amount of public support created around those efforts. The second part has been, I think we've come, and I've learned quite a bit, when we started, um, when we did the comprehensive plan update in 2002, it was the first time in 20 years our comp plan had been updated. We had a couple open houses, asked some folks to come. We've transitioned and we've learned. How do you utilize social media? How do you utilize all these new technologies that we have, the internet? in taking the time and the effort to go to the neighborhood association, go to the faith-based groups, go to the PTA, go to the farmer's market, go to other jurisdictions and give our presentation. And that has built region-wide support for this project. Um, so I guess that would be my example of not only being able to work with other jurisdictions, but also making sure that we're engaging the community, incorporating what we're hearing um, to continue to push um, an extremely exciting project that is very difficult and maintaining that partnership for going on um, over five years now. Commissioner Megaber. Um, as the city manager, how would you view your relationship with the city commission? How would you go about building and maintaining a strong relationship with them? I think that the key, I think that in, from what I've seen and the way I operate with um, the other relationships that I have is that clear communication is, is really the key. Um, making sure that information is, is shared, shared equally. My job is to help you make a right decision. Whatever you do, as the commission decides is right, and bringing you options um, to fulfill the goals and policies that you want to accomplish. And to do that in an unbiased way, but also utilizing our professional opinions. I have a professional opinion concerning land use and community development, which is my training. John Lewis has a professional opinion as it relates to engineering infrastructure. So realizing what goals you would like to accomplish, but, but bringing, making sure that we're bringing you the best options available. So communication is key, making sure it's equitable and not um, being perceived as pushing a personal agenda. Um, really making sure that I realize my job as a professional is to bring you options to successfully accomplish what you want to do. Um, how will I go about building and maintaining a strong relationship with the, the commissioners and the mayor? Uh, once again, I think that there are um, meet, um, quarterly meetings that we could have, trying to make sure that the communication that I have with you is clear, that it's consistent. Um, I think that those are the ways that we build those relationships. I think, um, for example, the event that we did today, working together on the presentations that we're going to be making to the city, understanding what are we trying to accomplish. Um, going back to the Lamet Falls Legacy Project, I think one of the, one of, one of the things I learned on that was um, we had a communication plan. Mm -hmm. And for this section of the project, here's what we're trying to achieve. Here are the talking points that are really important for folks to understand. And so assisting with that, <coughs> building that relationship of, okay, we all potentially agree that CSAFE is something that we want to see passed in November. How do we go about making sure that happens and how do we work as a team to accomplish that? So making sure, uh, hopefully, that um, when I present to you that we can build that trust that I am bringing you my best professional recommendation to accomplish what you need. So okay. hopefully that answers your question. How would you, how would your reporting staff or your peers comment when asked about your leadership style, your leadership strengths, and your leadership weaknesses? And what would this discussion tell us about you as a leader? Hmm. Let's see. I think that they would say about my leadership style is that um, I strive for uh, consensus, making sure that I allow for the free discussion of concerns, of issues. It's not only identifying how we get somewhere, but identifying what concerns there are along the way and how do we avoid those. Identifying issues early on. So making sure, I think that what they would say that my leadership style is um, consensus-based, but that there are times when 
at some point a decision needs to be made and that I appreciate everyone, everyone's input to get me to that decision that I do need to make. Um, I am not a micromanager. I believe that folks, that the folks we hire are professional and part of my job is to make sure that they understand those expectations but that they have tasks to do and I expect them to do that and I, but if there are questions or concerns identified or need clarification then I have an open door that you can come in and ask and we can talk about it to try to get to how do we keep moving this forward in a productive way. Uh, my leadership strengths, I think that uh, some of my strengths are um, that I can, um, I think I have the ability to consider um, a lot of information at the that's brought to me and try to work through the th parts of the information that aren't necessarily as important and the key issues that we need to identify and address. What are the positives? Where Where is a good strategy to move forward? And what are the concerns? And what do we need to be careful of or identify and, and provide more information about to make sure that whatever we're trying to accomplish doesn't get sidelined? Um, I would like to think that um, one of my strengths is my ability to actually remain pretty calm when things are going at 100 miles an hour. Um, providing that, that calmness, that leadership, it is something I've always appreciated. Um, when I was younger, it was the fire of the day. And as I have um, given the, been given the opportunity to realize that in that city manager seat, there are 10, 20 things going on at the same time. And you come in with your one fire. But always being calm about that, hearing what they have to say, and it's helping them to get moving forward. Um, me losing my temper or getting worked up does not help solve the problem in any way. Um, so I do see that as a strength of mine. Uh, my leadership weaknesses. I guess one of my weaknesses would be that I, I have faith I, I believe that when you're hired to do a job that you're going to do it, so I give you the benefit of the doubt that you will do that, and maybe sometimes I should not. Um, my objective is not to be punitive. It's to provide resources, assistance, guidance, so that we can get the best out of an employee. Um, and that may mean that I might be um, willing to continue to work with someone when it may aggravate other, other folks that, wow, this one, this was you, sh you need to discipline this more. You need to address this differently. Um, I certainly have that point. I understand the hiring process, the termination process, our contracts, documentation, work plans. Um, but you know what I found is we make errors. I've made errors. Um, it was not done maliciously. If it was, that's a different story. But for the most part, most of the folks I've worked with are just trying to make a good decision. And, and some of those decisions are really hard and need to be understanding of that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Polly. To what extent do you believe contact with citizens and citizen groups is important? How do you typically handle this responsibility and how will you build relationships with the community? I I have a profession as a planner, so I believe citizen involvement is goal one of the statewide planning goals, and it's very, very important. Um, we're entrusted with taxpayers' dollars, and we're entrusted to make good decisions for the community as a whole. And part of that includes communicating to the citizen groups, the neighborhood associations, of what we're doing. And, and really, that's, that's a two-way street. One is making sure that they understand how we're spending their money, building, showing that support, showing the good things we're doing. And the second part of that is to get the feedback. What are, what are the concerns out there? What are, what, what, are you, what are you seeing that we may not be doing that you'd like to see us doing? So I think citizen involvement is extremely important, um, not only from a long-term visioning, what is the goal of the city, but we need citizen support and buy-in for the things we want to accomplish in this community, whether it's addressing the parks maintenance issue, whether it's building something amazing at Willamette Falls, we've been able to take those steps, like I said earlier, with the library and the C-Safe, 
And, and so how do we continue to build on those? It is so nice to be building something and not talking about it. Um, how do I typically handle this responsibility? It's being available. It is going to the neighbor association. It has taken the time to identify. One of the things I implemented with our community development department was each of our planners have been assigned neighbor associations and they go to visit those. So it's having that face to face time with our neighborhood associations or the chamber or the Oregon City Business Alliance um, to make sure that, that, that those relationships can begin to grow and the trust between and the communication can, can, can occur. Um, and how will I build relationships with the community? Um, I think that there are a couple things that, that, that I can do. Um, I think that um, one of the things I love projects I love getting projects done but realizing that as a city manager that's not my role I don't think I'll ever be able to not want to know what's going on because I think it's important to be able to speak intelligently about what's happening in the city regardless of what department that is and being able to go out and field questions I might not be able to tell you which tour is scheduled on Friday in Willamette Falls anymore but I can tell you what we're doing on Willamette Falls or I can tell you what we're doing on the sewer moratorium project. And I think being able to take that, um, being able to go out and build that relationship, be accessible, be, not be afraid to take questions, um, I think is, is something that I can do. Okay. Commissioner Smith. Um, the city budget forecast is tending negative within the next five years. Explain what steps you would take to mitigate or prevent this from happening. I think that we have, um, in order to start to address the budget, um, I really do like to take a holistic view. I was a community development director when we went through the Great Recession. I had to make difficult staffing choices in our building department as well as our planning department, so it's twofold. It's one, it's looking at the revenues and the, and the work that you're doing and how you're expending those funds and what other opportunities there are. Fortunately, during the recession, we were able to obtain uh, a grant to do the South End Concept Plan, which helped to offset the staffing workload while land use application and the workload was, was diminishing. So that being said, I think it's really important to go and, for example, we've just updated our building fees. Are we, are we accurately collecting the revenues from the work that we're doing um, from the revenues from the fees that we're charging so really it's taking a look at okay we know we have an issue coming let's start making small steps to get us in position for five years from now that can avoid major cuts being implemented reassessing our budgets how do we reprioritize what we're doing we continually add two percent three percent for inflation every year maybe it's time to go back and and, and look at it can, can we ask everybody to come up with what are two or three or four percent savings we can do across the city? Are those opportunities there? Uh, I think that we always do need to look at um, our right-of-way fee, continuing to make sure that we're collecting for the use of the public right-of-way. That has a value. That is one of the most valuable assets we have. So trying to identify those other revenue sources that are out there that we may not have identified yet. Um, so I also think it's important to I think that we are in a, f a very fortunate situation to have 65 cents left on our taxable um, uh, ceiling. Every 10 cents is $260,000. Now this takes community support uh, in, in explaining how we're going to spend these funds. But I think that we're building that, that trust, that sh documenting how we are being responsible and making these decisions and then taking what we find when we when we look at all of these options that we have available to us and maybe we can get to where we need to be by making small tweaks along the way rather than one large drastic one to to make sure that we're in a in a good financial situation i was here when we went through the downturn and we had to do the fire annexation it was difficult and you know it i realize the sacrifices that were made to get us out of that um, and there was a good example there with the Blue Ribbon Task Force and the agreements we made to not raise taxes for five years um, in the staffing levels. It was a hard decision, but we made it and we did it. And that type of effort would be necessary. Commissioner Megaberg. 
Uh, one of our common, current challenges is the need for new or remodeled facilities. What is your experience in solving spa staff space issues and facility needs? No. Um, I have not had any uh, direct experience. I was the I was a planner when we moved from the old city hall into the current building that we're leasing right now. Um, but I have been involved in the conversations with trying to identify locations for. Uh, the library, the Public Works Operations Center, the police facility. Um, and um, I think that through through those endeavors, I think that it's it's become very evident that we need to really holistically look at where do we want to be in 20 years and what is our facility plan here to start making those decisions in a, in, a, in a way that's not as piecemeal. I think we've been we've been successful at addressing a couple of those issues with the police and the library, um, but we do have issues. We have parks, we have a parks issue in terms of the maintenance facility and where they're located. You have community development out of a out of a lease that's going to run in a year and a half, um, and so what creative things can we do to identify locations? Um, some of those discussions may be with the school district. Um, they're beginning to look at their facilities plans. They have significant needs as well. As well. Are there opportunities to, to work together on co-location or co-staffing? Um, I think one of my frustrations is, I think we would all acknowledge that we are understaffed in Oregon City. Um, one way is, um, that, that really frustrates me is I have very talented planners and building folks who work the front counter doing very basic tasks that if we had administrative staff or we had a consolidated place for that to be, it would not only mo use the, the staff person for what they're trained for, which would turn around permits faster, um, have them dedicated to the projects we need. So um, I don't think designing the space is, is the difficult part. I think it's having consensus and agreement amongst the elected officials and the citizens is where we want to go and then to start implementing that um, that plan. Okay. Commissioner Shaw. Tony, uh, Oregon City residents make up over 50 per Why do I always get this question? <laughs> Everybody's gotten the same questions. 50% <laughs> of the customers of the Tri-City Sewers District However, uh, governance of the district is controlled not by the city, but by the county. How would you suggest this inequity be uh, communicated to our citizens? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because I think that the communication about Tri-Cities is, is made a little bit difficult because we've done a pretty good job of maintaining our infrastructure as it relates to sanitary sewer. Um, and so I think that part of this, once again, is a concerted effort to go out and put in the time and the energy to explain to folks why the governance structure does not represent their interests and some of the, um, the importance you know, Tri-City's been functioning here for a long time, and it's been functioning without a lot of issues unless you're very close to the issues. And so explaining that to the, to the, to the average parent like myself who gets home at night and doesn't have time to go to a, a, a Tri-City Advisory Committee meeting or see what the Board of County Commissioners are doing as it relates to rates or decisions to take on indebtedness, um, that takes effort of going out. And we have that network in place. I think we have the citizen involvement committee, we have the neighborhood associations, we have those venues. It's a matter of going out and taking that message to them so that they understand. I think part of this also, I talked a little bit earlier about you know, advances we can make in terms of how we communicate what we're doing. Um, I know jurisdictions that sent out a bi-weekly email flash of here are the three things we want you to know that's going on in the city. and, and an easy, effective way to communicate issues to the community. Um, so once again, I think it goes back to a, a solid communication plan and then putting in the effort. There is no quick and easy way to reach folks. It's going out and putting in the work to go where they're at and explain the issue to them and the concerns. The commission has placed a sewer moratorium in effect for certain parts of the city. Please explain the thought process that you would use in drafting communications to address the continuing concerns of developers affected by the moratorium. 
I think that as far as the sewer moratorium goes, I think we've been successful in um, alleviating five of the seven moratorium areas. Um, but if you are impacted by the, the sewer moratorium, obviously that's a concern as an impact on your business and your ability to develop your property. I think having a clear and concise timeline explaining to them that we've made the financial investments We've staffed up to address this. This is the number one priority of the commission in the city to address these moratorium issues. And here is the scope of, not the scope of work, I'm sorry, the timeline for us to complete those. Right now, uh, we have the scope, of work, the scope of work approved for Lynn Avenue, and we will be having a timeline for when we hope to have those completed. And making sure that they're informed. We set that system up so that folks could come in and get approved contingent on the moratorium being lifted. So making sure that they're aware that that is available to them. Let's get through the land use process. Let's get through the engineering process. As soon as that moratorium is lifted, here is your building permits and you can go. So once again, it's making sure that we effectively and thoughtfully communicate with those that are impacted by that moratorium. Commissioner Smith. What? What is your vision for a successful tourism program in Oregon City? Yeah. I think that a successful <laughs> I think that a successful tourism program in Oregon City um, is one that's self-sustaining. I think that it brings in visitors and it's identifying funding sources, whether that's grants through the county, cooperation with the city, putting together that strong partnership to make sure that tourism is successful and can be an economic driver in our community. Um, in what form that takes, I think we've taken some initial steps on the, on the strategic plan that's being created <coughs> and to continue to work through. Um, but a successful tourism program is one that encapsulates and, and um, highlights all the things that we have to offer in Oregon City, whether that's fishing along the river, it's access to our parks, it's the amazing uh, restaurants that we've created in our downtown, the historic fabric of our community. But we're also a jumping point off into very accessible places in Clackamas County, whether that be for um, just taking a tour, bike riding, fishing, uh, getting out on a hike. So putting together that comprehensive tourism package um, that's, that, that we are able to, to sustain. Um, you know, when I first saw the strategy, I was a little concerned about $400,000 a year. So making sure that we have the steps set up initially so that we don't fail as we're trying to keep accomplish each of those steps, making sure we have an understanding of, okay, what, what realistically can, can we accomplish in the next year, the next two years, the next three years? And then before we can go to the next step, we need to make sure that we have these certain requirements, whether it be grants, funding, um, in place so that we can successfully implement that plan. Commissioner Magelberg. What do you, um, <clears throat> what do you do when your views on handling a situation differ from those of the commission as a whole? My role as, is, is a professional one. I talked a little bit earlier about it. It's my role to make sure I give you the best advice um, and ways forward to accomplish what you need to accomplish. It would not be the first time that I have had to write, defend a position I don't necessarily agree with. But that's not my role to make that decision. My decision is to implement what the commission's majority decides. Um, it's been, it, it's difficult sometimes, uh, especially on a 3-2 vote. I think it's every staff member's worst nightmare. But um, that is my role. It is to make sure that you understand the implications of the decision, that it's legal, um, and that I present you the options. And once that decision is made, it is my responsibility to implement that. I will, I will certainly have a healthy debate as to my concerns or okay. ideas, but um, at the end of the day, it's not my decision. Okay. Commissioner Pauly. Can you describe an ethical issue that you have had to deal with in your career and how you handled it? Hmm. I think that the, well, I think that there has been a, a, a situation where 
Um, I believe that the role of the executive team is to make sure that the interests of the city as a whole are always protected. Um, I think that there has been a, a situation that arose when, um, you know, I I had a, I I went through an investigation on the transportation SDCs. I went through the process. I understand how the process works. I think the city has a process for how we address complaints, concerns, and investigations. I think that my role as the executive uh, on the executive team, when that is not occurring, is to bring that to the attention of the HR department and the commission. Uh, so I didn't feel that um, what was happening was appropriate, ethical, nor in the best interest of the city. And so at the end of the day, it was about what's doing right. What is the right thing to do? How should this be handled in making sure that that happens? Um, so uh, in, in that type of a situation, that's how, that's how I approach that. We have a system in place. It's not only to safeguard the accused, but also the city, and it should be followed. Okay. Commissioner Shaw. Uh, what kind of relationship do you want to have with the management team and the rest of the staff, and how will you establish? Um, I talked a little bit about, um, I really do believe that um, having an open, the ability to have open and honest communication with staff is so important. Um, avoiding siloing, protecting information, protecting pertinent information that, that could impact decisions cannot occur. Um, by the time we're making decisions at the executive level, the management level, or the city manager or the commission's level, um, they're usually difficult decisions. So making sure that we, I have that open door policy, that um, people are free to bring me ideas, no matter what they are. Um, some of the greatest ideas have come that I would have never thought of. So making sure that I have the ability to hear that. And I think it's my role as a city manager to communicate that to my executive team as well as the staff. Setting those expectations of what I expect from them as well as that I'm, I'm accessible. Um, I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear the concerns. Um, we have so many employees out in the community working on issues, working with citizens. They have a wealth of knowledge and making sure that that, that, that information is, is passed back and forth is important. Um, so, and how would I establish that? I think it just, it takes effort of communicating appropriately. It's taking the time to, um, I meet with the directors at least, you know, formally weekly, but on a regular, uh, constant, daily. Um, but making sure that I do have those interactions with the management team. We have a quarterly management meeting. It's an opportunity to do that. I see some more than others, depending on the situations. But then going that extra step, visiting staff at their staff meetings, just walking around and talking to people, hearing what's going on. I think that's the role of the city manager. It's, it's, it's a communicator. It's a facilitator, not only with the community and the commission, but with the staff that, that you know, is able to make us be successful at what we want to do. How would you go about building or rebuilding a positive relationship with other governments with whom there has been conflict in the past? Well, I think that it's been interesting that managing the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. Um, up until recently, we, Clackamas County, did a lot of our building inspecting. So I feel like I do have some of those relationships in place right now to be able to, to work with. I have good relationships with Metro. I have good relationships with, with, with the state. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that in my, in my opinion, um, you know, I think that I don't, I try not to make it personal. It's professional. We can disagree professionally. We can have a discussion about it. Um, you know, we have these, the, the, these different layers of government decision making for a reason. Sometimes they have to become political. But, you know, it's not my job to be political. It's my job to be professional, to treat people with respect. They have opinions just like I do. They could think my position is completely crazy. But I would at least expect them to hear it, actively listen to it. We, we, and we, we can agree to disagree. And then we, and then we work on how do we solve that. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's, that is going to be one of, the, one of the difficulties. I think that our relationship with Clackamas County is strained. And I think that will take a lot of time. 
but we've had discussions about how can we co how can we invest in economic development on Beaver Creek Road? How can we look to address some of the transportation problems on 213? It's not an Oregon City problem. It's a county. It's a regional problem. And so those are areas of, of where we can where we can agree. I think that there are a lot of areas where we can find agreement and work on things um, that helps build that relationship. So when difficult decision comes up, we have that relationship to rely on. But it's going to take time. Mr. Mengelberg. Describe your experience obtaining grants. What agencies would you approach for grants? What kinds of grants do you think would benefit Oregon City? Let's see. I have been um, writing and obtaining grants um, starting with the comprehensive plan rewrite, um, whether it's through the state, through uh, their their transportation and growth management grants, um, <coughs> continuing on through the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, um, successfully applied for grants through the community planning and development grant process at Metro. Um, so I do have that experience of writing writing grants, identifying where they're at. Um, uh, what agencies would I approach? Um, you know, the main ones that we, that we get to rely on are, are Metro, the state of Oregon through their land use. Um, and then, you know, there are, there are grants that come up. Some of them may be available for public infrastructure. It's trying to identify some of those grant opportunities that are out there. Um, what kind of grants do I think would benefit Oregon City? Um, you know, I think that some of the grants that we may need to start looking for, um, um, you know, whatever funding that we can bring together as it relates to infrastructure, whether that be for vehicular infrastructure, bike ped infrastructure, as I think is a place where we've, um, we've, we've lagged a little bit. How can we create our, our family friendly streets and make those connections to schools from the neighborhoods? Um, you know, we also are looking at grants for, for some of our, our transportation infrastructure. What kind of street improvements can we make and what kind of grants are available to accomplish that? And I think that we're very competitive as a regional center and should continue to do that. Um, and then, you know, it's been, um, you know, the comprehensive plan is probably getting to the point where we need to, we need to revisit it. Um, and so, you know, there are grants available to do that. The state, the state spot, you know, does provide a lot of opportunities for jurisdictions that want to provide updates to their comprehensive plans and whatnot. So, you know, I think that those are out there and, and achievable for us. And we've been successful in the past. Commissioner Shaw. Right. If you are selected, Mr. Conkle, as the successful candidate and understanding that pay and benefits are matters for negotiations, tell us in broad terms what sort of compensation package you would expect. Um, hmm. um, I think that I would expect a compensation package that is consistent with what we see in the region here based on um, my experience. I hope that there would be consideration for the experience that I bring as being a longtime employee of Oregon City and the value that that adds to um, what I hope can be a successful city manager for the city. Um, so it's, it's a negotiation and um, I'd like to consider myself a reasonable person um, and I think that there are a lot of examples of reasonable compensation packets that we can rely on to look at in the region. Okay, so uh, I'm taking the last three. Uh, what kind of severance package would you expect if you were terminated? I, I, I guess I would go back to the question, the answer I just had. I think that there are examples of reasonable severance packages that, okay. that, that communities can, can agree to. Um, so uh, is there anything else you want to tell us or are there any questions you would like to ask? Um, I think I, I would like to, like to tell you that um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I do appreciate you taking the time to, to consider me for the city manager position. Um, I hope that you know, as I've been serving as a city manager pro tem since, since August, uh, that I've been able to demonstrate some of the leadership and decision-making qualities that, that you'd like to see as a leader of this community. Um, I thoroughly enjoy working in Oregon City. I would enjoy working with the residents that I get the opportunity to work with. I think we have one of the most amazing staffs around. Um, and I enjoy working with, with the commissioners and the mayor. Um, it's not always 
the issues aren't always easy, but I think that our ability to communicate with one another, respect one another, helps us get through those hard decisions. And I would hope to have the opportunity to continue to do that. Um, and I guess my, my questions I'd like to ask you are, um, what would you like to see in the next city manager? What are your expectations as a city manager? I mean, I can kind of get them from the questions, but I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts. Who wants to go first? Oh, boy. We weren't expecting this. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Commissioner yeah. Pauly. Yeah. Um, I would say just bringing the best out in their team, working together as a team, um, seeking out um, our concerns on a regular basis, um, being flexible and nimble, um, and just really, really getting the best out of your team and just a really healthy um, work environment as far as your team and the commission. Thank you. I would, I, yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Commission President Smith. Yeah, President, you got it. Sorry. <laughs> well, you let Carol cut in front of me. I'm just yeah. <laughs> hey, I only got to ask I two just, questions. Yeah. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> I don't know how many I have. Um, I, I think, you know, my vision for, uh, for a great city manager is someone who um, can buy into the community. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're from the community, but really have a buy into the community, understand the community um, and its people. Um, someone that has buy in enough to stick with it and to stay with it. And, and um, you know, as we know in Oregon City, some of our projects are not two, three, four year projects, they're ongoing projects. And the, the consistency that a city needs, I think, to follow through on those projects is very important and um, you know having someone that has a buy-in enough to stay with it that long to understand that that's the only way that those large projects are going to happen. Um, someone that is responsive and um, open to hearing um, from staff and from the commission. Um, someone that um, you know, does, um, you know, that is available there when you need a question. And I, I think most of us, I, I, well, I'll speak for myself, I don't, I don't think I am overly, um, you know, communicating with the city manager unless it's something that's really, you know, important. That, that um, and when there are those key moments, you know, having someone that you know that can, can get back to you as soon as possible. And sometimes it, it takes a little while, but um, the, the dialogue, um, being able to have a relationship with someone that you can at least know that they're listening to you and, 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 and the commission as a whole. Um, I think that's, I mean, there's more to it than that, obviously, but those are some of my big I think the personal piece is a huge piece. Um, it's 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 um, you know, how you build relationships with the community, how you build relationships with the people that you're working with is is so much more important sometimes than 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 the um, day to day um, routine. Commissioner Shaw. Well, Commissioner President uh, Smith here. Uh, brought up with, uh, some of the same points, but I think endurance is uh, kind of a key factor <laughs> in this uh, position, Tony, and uh, um, as you well know, because these projects, as I've learned over the last year, are just, I mean, we've got projects that have been going on for five, six, seven years, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> endurance <laughs> is kind of a key term there, but also I noticed there's um, kind of an educational component here that says that we've got some things going on and, and that we've been doing where we've had to go out and educate the public. You know, we did that with the library, we did it with C-Safe, 
you know, and that's going to keep going on. And then we've built this thing, you know, and that's what I'm looking at for the this person is that we that's going to be a uh, have that professional image out there that we know that when this person goes out and it's representing or we're going out there's that you know this professional uh, image out there that because we're going to have a lot of uh, education things that we're going to have to do with the community here with uh, even with this urban renewal thing so uh, and I th and that's kind of yeah I think those three terms is uh, you know that, that we can educate the public uh, that there's a professional atmosphere here and that uh, you have the endurance for the job so okay. Commissioner Magor um, I see a lot of new development on the horizon so being able to make sure that these complex projects keep moving forward there's a lot of communication coordination finance legal issues involved in all that and uh, that's going to take a lot of attention so successfully hurting the cats keeping it moving keeping <laughs> us informed I think that's going to be a big challenge for the city manager in this time um, having said and you already do um, having knowledge about development because that's on our plate you know, it's a kind of a specialized expertise um, and then I think the other commissioners have hit on it as well as communication you know communicating all the great work that this city's doing letting the public and, and all of our various stakeholders know what's going on and and how they can find the information the CDR does a great job but you know people are getting their information in different ways now so a press release isn't going to do it anymore you know that kind of thing um, and um, the relationship part of it you know we've got a lot of stakeholders a lot of long-standing entities that we need to work with and if they're on our team they're working with us amazing things can happen if if we let small things get in our craw and stop stand in the way of the bigger picture then that that would be unfortunate so for me the, the, there's a couple three key points um, that that will lose me almost immediately and that's honesty and integrity um, you and I can have a an extreme disagreement on policy but as long as I know you're being honest with me and I'm being honest with you that's okay you know we're not going to be at 100% agreement all the time um, so uh, you know always be honest with me I'll always be honest with you and I think that's a huge deal um, the way you treat your people is a big deal to me um, because I've always been a leader that says I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I haven't done or I'm not willing to do um, and and to treat people with respect and that you praise people publicly and you chastise people in private and 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 do all that and I'm, I'm confident that you're that guy my only other pet peeve and I don't know if you know this or not is that you and I are in a special place and that is, is that you know you're the guy in charge of the city administratively I'm the guy that's in charge of the city politically and our phones always have to be on so you know there are going to be situations when I may call you at 11 o'clock at night um, because somebody's called me and there's something that I think is important enough for you to know um, now I can't guarantee that I will always pick up the phone but I almost always do and that was the thing that I had a, an issue with our, our last city manager was that sometimes by seven o'clock at night his phone was turned off and I couldn't reach him. So, understood for me. Yep. So Commissioner Polly has an additional question that she wanted to ask. Well, we all came up with additional questions, yep. and I just well, wanted the, the to. previous we didn't really want to do a whole bunch of this because the previous guy ran out of time before we could get to these. So, uh, if you guys want to go ahead, go ahead, Commissioner Polly. Thank you. Um, so in our in our city, you know, we don't have an assistant city manager, so we don't have that um, mentoring structure in place. So I believe mentoring um, and having support in a new position is important. Do you feel this way? And um, if so, how will you seek out the support for yourself if chosen? How will I seek out the support for? 
like like a mentoring support um, to have that structure in place for you um, being a new city manager um, what resources will you use how will you reach out and get that help um, that support that support yeah and I, I appreciate that question I think that there are a couple things that I do currently that I continue to expand on I truly believe that we have several directors that could be city managers I think relying on their insight, their their performance, what they've learned um, is important. Um, we meet regularly <laughs> with uh, the other city managers uh, in Clackamas County. Mm -hmm. um, and the discussions I've had with every one of them has offered, if you ever have a question, um, an issue that's come up, please <coughs> call me. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, working through ICMA. I think that there are many, many resources there um, that can assist someone like myself who's never been a city manager before. Um, so I see those as some of the resources that I have available to me mm -hmm. um, to help with the mentoring or, wow, have you ever dealt with this before, mm -hmm. type of questions. Good. Commissioner Magenberg? Let's see. Um, the city's successful urban renewal district uh, faces a ballot measure um, that could eliminate the program. Uh, how would you advocate, um, advise staff and the council to protect this valuable tool? Yes. Um, I think that, you know, once again, we've talked a lot about, you know, if, if, if these are truly programs, policies that we think are important as a community, as a commission, <coughs> then we need to be able to put that effort in to explain to folks the other side of the argument. That means having a communication plan. That means going out to the neighborhoods. That means going out to the citizen involvement committee. It means it means engaging the community to explain why this tool to us is so important. Realizing that once it's on the ballot measure, some of the what I can provide is not available anymore unless it's neutral. Um, so and those are things that we can discuss. Um, but um, you know it. It's, it's like running for an election. It's an election. We need to go out and make sure our message is clear, concise, and understandable. And, um, and if it's truly something that we think is that important, then we need to put that effort in to, to do that. Once again, I go back. There is no easy way to inform the public, especially when it's a complex issue like, like urban renewal. Commissioner Smith, did you have a question? Um, yes, but I'm not going to ask it. Okay, Commissioner Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I, I want to I want to be consistent with the other candidate, which oh, we didn't okay. have time to answer. All right, it, and I, all I right. don't think that. Okay, so um, our previous city manager made sure that all communications from city commission went through him. Uh, do you have, if you were to get this position, do you, is that the same kind of operation you'd like to have <laughs> or? Yes, it is. I think that um, for, the, for the responsibilities that I have to administer this city, I, I need to be informed of communications that are happening with my directors. Um, I don't think it's appropriate uh, for some of the, for those communications to happen. It puts the director in a tough spot. It puts the city manager in a tough spot and then I cannot in a um, communicate that to the rest of you and I think that creates issues it creates issues for you not knowing and it creates issues for me um, so you know there's there is a chain of command and, and there's a reason that's in place and it's not only to make sure that I can operate this and understand what's happening with my staff who I am directly responsible for for and responsible to but that system is in place to protect you as the elected officials as well. There are certain um, responsibilities that you have, and some of those, you know, we need to make sure that we don't we don't blur the line on. So that would be my my thought on that. Okay. Good. So uh, I'm going to ask, and this this question wouldn't have applied to the other day anyway. So, um, given that you're a first time city manager, should you be selected? Would you be willing to tie? Uh, an increase in your compensation to the successful completion of the steps in the ICA MA's city manager program? Certainly. Okay. Anything else? 
Anybody? All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to adjourn into executive session to consider the information we've heard tonight. Uh, did we make provision to come back out? Okay, so then.